What's happening, folks? How's everybody doing? Jason Rad, what's up? Michael Hinn, what's up? Daryl, Jeff, Witchell. <laughs> you actually made it to the live stream this time. I'm uh, I'm happy for you. All right. Well, hey, folks, it is uh, 1 a.m. here in Africa. I'm living on uh, Mountain Dew, Red Bull, and uh, African cocaine, so it's it's all good. We'll give everybody a chance to uh, jump in. If uh, you haven't said hello yet, say hello so we can acknowledge you, say hi back. We got some exciting news to talk about besides what we are going to be discussing that's very related. Um, Tony, good to see you. John Walsh, good to see you. John, open. What's up, man? Hope everybody's doing well this Wednesday evening or now here Thursday morning. Willie, what's going on, man? How you doing? The one redeeming quality I can say about uh, here in Africa is that it is not cold. I'm sure it's pretty chilly back yonder. Paul Walker, what's happening, man? How you doing? Brian, good to see you. Oh. I wish I could tell. Uh, I, never mind, I can't tell. First time I've noticed this. I was gonna ask. I wish I could tell who's tuning in from Facebook and who's tuning in from um, YouTube, but it does show it actually. And it's the first time I've noticed. I, I wonder if this is a new feature. They're showing a little icon of either Facebook or YouTube. Rob Worley, good to see you, man. No, it is not cold in Florida. Michael C. Uh, Rob, what is what is the temp down in Florida? We need to move to Florida. Somewhere there. Actually, where I'd like to move is, is uh, South Carolina. Charleston area, one of these days. We'll have uh, maybe our headquarters there in the D.C. area or vice versa. We're going to keep training there in the D.C. area. There's no doubt about it. 75. That's about what it is here. It's not bad. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am currently in Cameroon, Yaoundé, Cameroon. And uh, this is an interesting place. I've been to uh, several countries in Cameroon. I mean, in Africa. Um, Jersey, what's up, buddy? How you doing? <sighs> Chris Clark, yeah. South Carolina, uh, man, I, I love the Charleston area, I really do, and so does my wife. That's what that's what really matters. Paul, yeah, big fan of South Carolina. A lot of her family lives in Georgia; it'd be close by. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, anyways, it's pretty interesting here. Um, I would probably say so far out of all the places in Africa, it might be my least favorite. So not exactly, a, you know, a destination spot, but uh, it's uh, it is what it is. All right. So a couple of big things um, that I just found out yesterday. So for those of you um, been following us on the NPA series, we've had lots of requests for seven mil PRC and, and for good reason. We're going to get some of that tonight. Um, right now, MPA is looking at 60 days out. They will be tooled up and ready to start chambering rifles in six, five, uh, seven millimeter PRC. So if that is something you're interested, I talked to them yesterday about this and I asked them if we could start taking pre-orders because we already have several clients that have asked for this. Um, and they said we could, and right now there's nobody else asking for seven millimeter PRC pre-order so what that means is if you want to order one a couple of things number one we would be first in line we already got about six rifles um that clients are wanting we're going to put in another order for 10 um <clears throat> and just just to have but if you want exactly what you want you can put in a pre-order and um we will actually so just but understand 
that 60 days thereabouts, plus or minus, is when they're planning to be ready to start chambering rifles to seven millimeter PRC. From that point on, you're looking at about eight weeks for a um, you know a build time. So eight weeks plus or minus the 60 days. <clears throat> excuse me, 60 days plus or minus plus the eight weeks is what we're looking at as far as uh, being tooled up and ready to go. So um, again, if you want to place a pre-order, get your pre-order in now. Uh, again, we're going to put you, you're going to be right at the front of the line uh, if that's something you're interested in. What I plan on doing is I plan on getting exactly what Christian is saying down here, um, a rifle in seven millimeter PRC and 300 PRC. Uh, the bolt face is the same, so you don't have to buy an additional bolt, um, but understand too that that is long action. And I don't have this option on the website. It literally, I found out today, uh, we'll have it up on the website. Uh, something that P MPA did change, and for those of you that bought 300 PRCs and stuff in the past, you guys got grandfathered in. But what they did change is that all long actions are an additional, I think it's 250 upcharge. I'll get the specifics of that. I think by tomorrow we will have those options on the website. So you'll be able to build out your rifle exactly what you want. If you want a single barrel, double barrel, whatever it is you want, whatever color you want, what other accessories that you want, but we will be able to offer those. Um, and again, you know, we're looking at about 60 days to start the build. So um and we'll get into this we'll, we'll kind of get into some of the good reasons yes left-handed is available left-handed is always available with all mpa rifles um another cool thing i just ordered uh both for my for my son and another client which i'll, I'll talk to that was kind of a cool thing as well but long story short we just ordered some youth rifles in um or you know, they're on order so that is another option too, folks, is you can get a youth rifle. And the cool thing about this is, is essentially the chassis is the same. The only difference is a shorter length of pull stock. And that shorter length of pull stock is completely interchangeable with a full size stock. So what I did and what the client did is we both, he's buying one for his granddaughter, I think. Um, I'm buying one for Noah. And... But what we're doing, we're both doing is getting the full size, and you can get that in folding stock too, by the way. Um, but we're getting a full size folding stock with it, ordering with it, so that if and when, not yet, but when they grow out of that short length of pull stock, we can throw on the full size stock, and now they have a gun that you know they'll be able to have for the rest of their lives, which I think is really really cool. Um, you know, it's a pretty nice gun to get as a kid. There's no doubt about that. They cost about the same price as the PMR Pro 2. Um, you know, they're obviously not cheap, but, you know, they are a gun that's going to last several generations. You can rebarrel them very easily. You can switch out the barrels very easily on those rifles. You know, it's a rifle that will be relevant, I mean, forever. I mean, that's so cool thing. Josh Dubik, good to see you, man. Christian Clark, Yeah. Um, I mean, really all the PRC rifle, uh, cartridges are pretty amazing, you know, and, and again, we're going to get into a lot of that tonight. So what we're going to do is I'm going to jump into this PowerPoint. And I'll tell you right now, I, uh, started working on this about six hours ago and, you know, I didn't, I took for granted the rabbit hole that I kind of needed to go down. I ended up, what I planned on doing was, you know, talking about, the basic trajectories, pros and cons of all those things, and we'll get into all that stuff. But the other thing that I really need, realized that I needed to do was talk about also where PRC cartridges came from and also the modern cartridges and the modern bullets. Um, Dan, what's going on, man? I was just talking about you, about uh, all the work you got to do on the website. We'll talk about it later. Um, <clears throat> but anyways... Uh, so that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that people understand where these cartridges are come from, why they exist, what makes them better than previous cartridges. And again, we'll get into all this. So we're going to dive into this. I'm going to throw up a, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here in just a second. Um, every other slide or so, or every slide, I will pull that down because I can't see, uh, what is happening in the comments. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. 
as we go along, I'll pull it down every now and then look, see what we got for comments or questions. Uh, I'll try to address those and then we'll keep plugging along. The beginning of this, the first couple slides, folks, might be a little bit rudimentary for some of you that have been shooting for, for a while, but I want to make sure that we define the terms so that for those that are watching it now and in the future, if they, um, you know, they're not as educated when it comes to um, cartridges, uh, bullet terminology, cartridge terminology, I want to make sure I, I kind of front load all that stuff. So, you know, again, we're just all on the same terms and we're not talking above anybody's head. Daryl says, as much as I love my Delta 5 Pro, she's like, dream. I wish I had known the other rifle maker at the time. Guess I need to start saving up again. Same same thing here, Daryl. I uh, bought my Delta 5 Pro at the time. We weren't even a dealer. I bought mine uh, full price. And uh, so anyways, it's it's just one of those things. And you know what, man? That's a that's an excellent, excellent rifle. There's no doubt about it. You don't need to save it for anything. Keep that rifle for a long time. Um, learn on that rifle. Train on that rifle. Um, you know, MPA, the MPA is a slightly better rifle, but it is not going to make you a better shooter. It won't. You have a, you have a top of the line rifle as it is. <clears throat> Thanks for sending me down the rabbit hole with 300 PC, which caused me to find out more seven PRC as well. Yeah, that's again. And I went down the rabbit hole for a long time and still doing it. All right. So I'm gonna throw up this PowerPoint folks. We'll, we'll jump into this and let me figure out how to share my screen. I always forget. Uh, that's not it. That's not it. Dan, why aren't you here running this thing for me? It's down here somewhere. Settings, presents, uh, extra camera. Here we go. Share screen. It's like window or screen. This is so stupid. Why is it so? We'll do just entire screen. Oh, wow. All right. So we are going to throw this up. I am going to see what we're doing here. There we go. Hopefully you guys can see that. All right. So this is this is our topic tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about Creedmoor 6.5 PRC, 7 millimeter PRC and get into this. So I, I want to make sure that we understand <clears throat> where we're coming from on this and, and again, why these cartridges exist to begin with. Um, so again, when we're talking about just the case itself, we're talking about or understanding that this is the mouth, the neck, the shoulder, the wall, and all of this will be relevant. We'll be getting into this a little bit. Um, this is a little misleading because this entire portion down here is the head of the case. Um, then we got the base, the extractor groove, all that stuff. When we're talking about the bullet, this is something that a lot of people don't understand. And again, it's really important to, to understand the benefits of these modern cartridges. But basically we have your overall bullet diameter, which is this portion right here. Um, so for instance, like a 260 Remington, which is also a, or 260 millimeter, which is also 65 millimeter, the actual bullet diameter is 0.264. And where we get the bore diameter is right here at the beginning of the ogive, which we'll talk about that in just a second as well. So this bearing surface, this is what makes contacts with the lands and grooves. Um, and then you have the overall length of the bullet. You have the ogive, which we'll get a little bit more in just a little bit. Uh, but understanding this and, and the evolution of bullets, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, I, is really important. All right, so we have the ogive right here, which we'll define further in just a second. We have the cartridge overall length. And then the base to ogive. So cartridge overall length and then base to ogive. Um, and then here's just a SAMI spec. This is the Horny 300 PRC SAMI spec. Some things that we are going to talk a little bit about is the shoulder angle. Um, on all of these PRC cartridges, the shoulder angle is 30 degrees. Um, and, and we'll, we'll get into that. And I just want to make sure 
all right we're still uh we're we're still doing it right all right cool I'm trying to make sure this thing works all right so folks if, if you don't know and you're not aware you know the, the kind of the cartridge evolution we started off with straight wall cartridges and we eventually moved to bottleneck cartridges. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. I'm not going to get into that. Hopefully, you also understand that we once had, you know, muzzle loaders and we were shooting ball shot, but we're not going to cover that tonight. But I want you to notice what's going on here, folks. There's a there's a uh, basic trend that's happening here. You have a lot of cartridge. You have a lot of uh, case with a lot of powder. And then you have a very small, essentially, ratio version of, of the bullet itself. So basically what we said was, hey, we want these bullets to go further. So we just added more and more horsepower to these bullets. And then we started to improve on bullet shape and understand ballistic coefficients and things like that. And as we move further in this, you can see here. This is our, our modern cartridges. There's several cartridges here that have been used for the last 60 to 70 years or more. Um, so, for instance, just to give you some scale on this, I can tell just by looking. This is 308 Winchester right here, and this is 300 Win Mag. But there again, we were, we we're still tackling the same problem with the same solution, and that was we were just adding more and more powder to um, – let me go back here. We were just adding more and more powder to push these projectiles, but we did get better on the projectile shape to increase the ballistic coefficient. Uh, and that's what we were trying to do. We we're trying to get more efficient with and maintaining velocity, bucking the wind, all of those things, while still being able to shoot that projectile further uh, down the road. And here's a great example of this right here. So <clears throat> what we have on the left is a 260 Remington. And on the right there, you have a 6.5 Creedmoor. And that is a perfect example of exactly what has taken place just in the last couple of years with really, I, you know, what two things had a major impact. Let me back out of here for a second. Two things had a major impact on um, ballistics and what we're doing right now. And that is uh, the main thing being... I see that we're presenting. So anyways, the main thing being Brian Litz. Brian Litz completely has revolutionized uh, long-range shooting. He brought a lot of science to it, a lot of fact-based information. You know, just a few years ago, we were dealing with a lot of companies that were creating these ballistic coefficients and these bullet designs based on computer models. And the problem with that was a lot of that wasn't true. It, it didn't. It didn't translate. So we had these drastically um, over-exaggerated ballistic coefficients on a lot of these bullets out there. Well, Brian Litz, being an aerospace engineer, kind of brought some science to it. He actually started testing these things, uh, started using Doppler radar, and basically called bullshit on a lot of the ballistic coefficients and completely revolutionized that, as well as started working with different, different bullet manufacturers. Uh, I know he was working hand in hand with Berger and a few other bullet manufacturers, helping them to design better bullets that were much more efficient and had a much higher ballistic coefficient. Um, and that's kind of where we're going with this. And again, there you can see the 260 Remington versus PRC. And look at the difference that we have here. This We have a much longer bullet and these are very similar in cartridge overall length. And we can look at the SAMI specs on those in just a second. But we have a very similar overall length. But look at the difference as far as down here we have a powder. We have a 20 degree versus a 30 degree shoulder. Um, and close to the same amount of powder. But there again, look at that bullet. And we will look at the effects of that. And you'll see that trend continue. And here's a great just kind of a the the absolute modern evolution of bullets here we have 300 wind mag we got this tiny little bullet up here and then we have the 300 norma mag which is very similar to this but we have a much more tangent tipped bullet and then we're moving over here to the secant 
And really, this is probably more of a hybrid. It's definitely more of a hybrid, and we'll, we'll define that in a second as well. So just so we understand the bullet shapes and, and terminology, we can look right here. This is a secant radius, and this is what we've been using essentially for the last, I don't know, probably 50, 60 years. Um, I'm sorry, a tangent. We've been using tangent bullets for the last 50, 60 years. They look very like much like this, uh, just a standard stereotypical 308 bullet is a tangent radius. Um, it looks a lot like, it looks a lot like it just kind of football shaped here. And you can see that here versus the secant ogive. So we have a tangent ogive and the secant ogive. And for those of you that don't know, the tip of a bullet is called a me plat, not me plat. Uh, it's a French word, probably pronounced me play or something silly like that, but we're Americans and we don't do that. So, but here we have the bearing surface. Look how much longer that is. And then we get into the secant of a job. We have a much shorter bearing surface. Um, bullet to weight, bullet radius to length is much higher. And that definitely helps with uh, overall ballistic coefficient. So, um, Again, that's where this has continued to move toward. You can see this is actually from Berger. We can see the tangent ogive versus the secant ogive. And just so we're clear, the ogive is anything forward of that bearing surface. So, or the barrel, some people call this the barrel, but it's the bearing surface, the basically the flat portion of the bullet where it starts to take shape here forward is the ogive and then burger came out i think they were the first ones to come out with the hybrid ogive but basically we have a much longer ogive again we're increasing the length to compared to the sectional density of, of that bullet which there again is giving it a much higher uh coefficient and right here we can see um the sammy specs and just a, another comparison of 6.5 Creedmoor versus 260. 260 Remington is here on the left, and then we have 6.5 Creedmoor on the right. But look at this down here at the, the overall length is very, very similar. We have 2.8, so we're basically within two uh, one hundredths of an inch as far as overall length. But I also want you to look at this the actual case length is 2.036 on the Remington versus 1.92 on the 6.5 Creedmoor. And I wish they had actually given the, uh, uh, the from the case mouth to the uh, MEPLA measurement, uh, but they did. But regardless, you can see that we have a much longer bullet and a much longer ogive. And that's where a lot of this has come into play. Because essentially, if we're going to install what we would like to do is just take this 260 Remington and create and just be able to put a longer bullet in it. Right. But we can't because we're limited by the chambering of that as well as magazines, by the way. Um, so basically what they did because of those limitations of the actions that we're using and even magazine capacity uh, with the overall length, Basically, what they did is they squished down, and both of these, by the way, both of these bullets, 260 Remington and 6.5, are essentially 308 bullets that have been necked down. So all they've done is take a 308 brass and they've reshaped it to where we squish this down. We put a, on the 6.5 Creedmoor, we squish that down a little bit more, and it gives us a decent amount of case capacity. Uh, we put a much sharper angle on it, 30 degrees versus 20. So we squish the case down, which allows us to give us the room for the that much longer bullet. Um, and 6.5 Creedmoor was definitely one of the first ones to do this. And we'll take a look at comparison versus even 308, uh, which has been you know a standard for a really long time, probably one of the most prolific cartridges ever, uh, both in military use, civilian use, hunting, recreational shooting, competition shooting. And for good reason. Look, 308 is not, it is still a very, very relevant cartridge. Uh, it's still easy to load. Now, I will say, going back just a second, the, the only one of the downsides 
Um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so seating depth. So seating depth and neck tension, secant ogives, and even hybrid ogives to some degree are definitely much more. That's why you see reloaders playing with both seating depth so much um, as well as um, neck tension. So they're a little bit more sensitive to that, whereas the old school tangent ogives, you know, like 308, super easy to reload. I mean, you, you really, if you load it to Sammy spec every single time and you have consistent and you're using good bullets, you're going to shoot good groups and you're going to have consistent impacts. I will take consistency over all the other things that you would be trying to do, right? We're trying to get the, the maximum amount of velocity. We're trying to get, you know, uh, the least amount of drop, all of those things, I will trade for consistency all day, all day, every day. And that's what 308 does for you. And it is, it's really effective. And don't think for a second that it's a completely antiquated bullet because it's not, it's still relevant and will always be relevant. Let me jump out of here for just a second to see if we have any questions, gripes or complaints about summer. Um, Yeah, Mike, I did see that in the news. Um, I, I'm Right now, I know they're saying essentially the argument is because of the fact that they're not going to be able to get the system into place. Uh, but, man, I, I just don't see that surviving a, a, a Supreme Court hearing. But we'll see. Um, yep, Guns of America is great. Um, I definitely personally am not a fan of the NRA for lots of reasons. We can do a whole, we can do a whole st stream on that one day. One public podcast. What's going on guys. Glad you guys made it. I missed a little bit of the beginning, but that's all right. All right. doesn't look like we have anything too pressing right now. We'll, we'll continue on. Um, all right. So again, what we're basically with all these modern cartridges that we're looking at, everything from 6GT, 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, 6x47 Lapua, 6.5x47 Lapua, all of these cartridges is essentially we're trying to achieve this right here. We're trying to basically get a longer bullet with a still a relevant amount of powder and decent velocities, but in within the standard actions that we're using right now. And that is the overall goal with these. All right, so let's jump into 6.5 Creedmoor versus 308 versus 6.5 PRC. And then we'll hit a couple of these things, and then we'll go into just the PRCs and kind of compare those because that gets pretty interesting as well. But you can see here we have a trajectory comparison out to 1,000 yards, and we're looking at what we got going on. And this is, I'll tell you right now, my 6.5 PRC shooting at 1,000 yards, um, 147 grain Hornady ELDs, I'm running about 7.2. 7.2 is my dope for actually for 1,050 yards. Um, that's as far as I've taken it out so far. And my dope for that is 7.2 mils. So it's actually doing better than it even says here. Um, I... Man, I've been so impressed with that that round. I can't even can't even say enough about it. Super super stoked about it. Glad I got it. Um, it does everything six five Creedmoor does. Uh, it just does it a little bit better. And then we can see um, six five Creedmoor. We're running about ten mils at a thousand yards, and what that translates to. Let's just move it out to. We can look down here at uh, at 308. So 308, let's say a thousand meters, and we're looking at 12 mils. 12 mils, and it actually probably be more like 13 mils by the time we got to a thousand meters. Thousand meters is obviously. Oh, this is in meters, so never mind. I thought this was yards. All right. So, anyways, 12 mils at a thousand meters is essentially essentially 12 yards. So we're looking at. 36 feet of 36 feet of drop at a thousand yards. And this is actually a good, you know, this is another good thing. I, I put out a, uh, 
I actually need to repost that a short talking about bullet trajectories and the fact that, you know, if you, if you drop a bullet, if you had a bullet in your hand and you were able to drop that bullet at the exact same time, if that barrel was perfectly level with the ground, by the way. All right. So we have a barrel that's perfectly level with the ground. It is not up and pointed up in the air or anything like that. Perfectly level with the ground. If you drop a bullet at the same time that a bullet came out of that barrel, if you dropped it at the exact same time, both of those would hit the ground at the exact same time. Because bullets, once they leave the barrel, they need nothing but drop. But what we don't realize, there's nothing magical that speed is keeping it in flight. It's still falling at the rate of gravity, right? So it is always falling. And this is exactly what we're looking at. If we shot both of these off the top of a mountain and they were all pointing directly, they are all level with the ground, these bullets would do nothing but fall. But because your optic, you don't even realize it, you're actually angling that barrel up and you're creating that uh, parabolic arc, right? So that's what allows you to hit a target at a thousand yards. But I digress. All right. So again, at um, we can see how much we're looking at about 36 feet of drop at a thousand for 308. We're looking at about a little over 30 feet of drop with 65 Creed. And we, and again, I'm only running at about 7.2. So seven mils at a thousand. We're basically looking at about 35. Um, I'm sorry, 21 feet of drop at 1,000. So, you know, take that for what it is. Here we're looking at wind deflection. Um, and there again, we're looking at with 308, you have almost three and a half mils of deflection uh, at 1,000 yards. So there again, we're looking at three and a half meters. We'll just say yards to make it simple for everybody. So almost four yards at, so you're looking at, you know, 12 feet of wind drift at a thousand yards. So keep that in mind. Uh, I want you to look at this because this is where things get interesting because, you know, 6.5 Creed and 308 are within spitting distance, depending on how you load them, um, as far as actual velocities, right? They're, they're pretty darn close. Um, and you can see 308, it's just a little bit, but look how these lines start to diverge. The, the maintain velocity, and this is a thing, uh, I believe this is a 140 grain bullet that this chart came from versus a 175 grain bullet. You know, physics tells us that a heavier bullet is going to maintain velocity, and that's true. There's no doubt about it. It's going to maintain velocity better than a lighter bullet, and the only thing that overcomes that is basic efficiency right so we can tell that even though it's a lighter bullet it's maintaining its velocity better and it's actually again we have these lines diverging from one another um, and it's because of that ballistic coefficient it is just that much more efficient that is able to maintain that velocity because it's getting to the target faster and that's also why we have less we have less wind deflection because it's taking less time and it's not affected by the wind as long um, over that thousand meter distance. Um, retain energy. Another look at look at this graph. Here we have 308. It starts off significantly higher in energy than 65 Creedmoor. But here we get to about 500 yards. And now that retained energy, the 6.5 Creed overtakes the 308. Again, we have a much lighter bullet. It's moving. It's obviously, I mean, it's moving a little bit faster than 308, but not much. But and again, we see where that energy level starts. And by about 400, let's see, we need to be at 15. So at, at 1,500 feet, foot pounds which is where we want to be for big game, moose, elk. I don't know what deer is. It's not quite 1,500. Typically, that's where we want to be is 1,500 foot-pounds. And so both of those, you know, 
you're you're not killing a moose. You shouldn't be shooting a moose with six five three to begin with. But I'm just saying. Um, there again, right around 450 yards, we're now that the 6.5 Creed has more energy than the 308. And of course, 6.5 PRC is just kicking both their asses all the way through this, all the way out. So um, pretty straight and linear drop in energy there. Whereas because of the ballistic inefficiency, we see this 308 just nose dives after about 450 yards. Uh, this is a great, using a nine pound rifle, we can look at the difference in recoil. So we're looking at about 15 foot pounds of recoil with 6.5 PRC and just above right around 11 for 6.5 Creedmoor and right around 14 and a half or so with 308. Now, folks, just remember, regardless, and this applies to all of these, obviously, with a good muzzle break, we could reduce this by, you know, 40 to 60%. Um, I can tell you right now with the MPA muzzle break, and there's other great muzzle breaks that if you put it on there too, you probably wouldn't notice uh, a difference between the two. But again, with a good muzzle break, I can tell you right now, my 6.5 PRC shoots as soft as my 6.5 Pre. Um, it is super soft. It stays on target. You can watch your impacts and everything else. Now, I will say this, folks, for those of you, that's not the end of the story, right? So 6.5 PRC, just based on recoil, it, it is obviously going to recoil more than 6.5 Creedmoor. And, and there's always that, that trade-off because what we're wanting to be able to do is always be able to spot our own trace and or be able to spot our own impacts. But there is, there is, you see a lot of folks in PRS and other competitions, uh, shooting competitions going to like a six millimeter for, and for good reason, because there's almost no recoil from that six millimeter. And there are some benefits, but there are also some negatives on that. So when you're talking six millimeter, you're talking, you know, 243, which is darn close to, you know, 223, right? And I can tell you, when we're out there spotting, even for people that are shooting six millimeter bullets, it gets hard to see that impact. Yes, you are less likely to miss because of the recoil. But if you do miss, man, it is hard to see impacts. Um, and it's harder to see trace as well. So I, with the 6.5 PRC, you see impacts, you see trace, there's no doubt about it. Now, if I'm shooting off, if I'm shooting in any sort of improvised shooting position and or off of a barricade or something like that, I definitely want a lower recoil rifle. There's no doubt about that. So, um, you know, you got to balance that and think about that. If you plan on shooting competition, you need to shoot, shoot spend some time shooting off of barricades and figure out what works for you. Can you stabilize that that heavier round? Uh, and if you can, that's great because there's a huge benefit of shooting that bigger, heavier round because you're gonna see, you're gonna spot your misses easier. And or if you see your impact, uh, you'll be able to move to a target quicker. Um, and also the you know anyone that's spotting for you, including judges at a um, you know a competition, it is tough to see. And, and a lot of times, you know, they're using flash targets or they're using the magneto speeds, letting them know if there's an impact or not. So, you know, th there's those things. So all those things need to be considered. And it's it's not just as simple as, you know, heavier, harder, faster. That's not necessarily always the case. Let's see if we got any questions going on here. Uh Let's see. I love, I love the pulsar image is good, but you're pretty much limited to the base or 5.5 magnification. When you zoom, your digital zooming so it gets so pixelated. My like plane is ranging. Get one with. All right. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, the pulsar thermals. Um, you know the, the the other thing too, Alex, is there's definitely a big um, 
there's, there's lots of pulsar thermal optics out there, right? So, well, it just depends on which one you got. I know one of our clients, uh, he recently left his gun with us to do some cases. I forgot what model he had, but uh, with his permission, of course, I was out playing with that thing at night, and uh, it's pretty impressive. I know his cost a little over six grand. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time with it, but I can tell you they were better than the much more expensive thermal optics that we were using in, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan even 10 years ago. Uh, so for six grand, I know some of the, and I don't remember the nomenclature of them, but, um, you know, we had forward facing uh, thermals on the front, you know, forward mounted uh, of our optics. And, you know, those things were like 30 grand and they're definitely not as good as that that optic that costs six grand. So they've come a long way and, you know, there's definitely lots of uh, different models out there just depending on the price point. And of course you're going to get what you, you pay for. I have to guess range it and really limit button how far you can shoot with. Yep. All right. Uh, it was recoil. All right, so we're going to get to 6.5 PRC. And, folks, there is a lot of info. We'll probably do a, a part two of this. I have a list of other things that I wanted to cover tonight. I just didn't have time to put into this presentation a whole bunch of different things. Um, but, anyways, we'll get to this and just keep on going. So, bullet diameter, there we have 308, 284, 264, case length. You can see this. Here's what I want you guys to pay attention to, though, is the case of the cartridge overall length. We have 2.95, which, folks, by the way, that is you have to be very careful if you're shooting 6.5 PRC. Not very careful, but be conscious of making sure that when you load your magazines, you're pushing that sucker all the way to the back because you are coming within, I don't know, a couple of thousandths of the end of the capacity of, of that magazine. Um, so you gotta be a little, a little bit more careful loading that because that it's, it's maxing out all of those magazines. Um, seven mil PR, uh, PRC. And, and this is another consideration folks is it just realize that from six, five PRC to seven PRC and, and all the way up to 300 PRC, obviously, you are going to a long action, um, which is going to cost a little bit more. All the long actions do. Um, all of these have the same bolt face. Recently, a client asked if he could get a rifle in 6.5 PRC and then a second barrel with 300 PRC. Or let me, let me rephrase that. A 300 PRC rifle, long action, with an additional 6.5 PRC barrel. And just so we're clear, you can do that, but that 6.5 PRC is not going to cycle all that well and as consistently as it should when you're running basically a short action cartridge through a long action. It just won't. Um, you can play around with the magazines. Um, you can do a lot of different things that will improve that, but you're it's just not built to do that. So I don't consider that. A viable option you can do it and if you know as long as you don't plan on shooting competition with it because you're almost better off just you know hand loading that thing in there and just sitting on top of the magazine and pushing it in um and if you're fine if you understand that then you can do that but it's definitely not optimal to say the least all right so here we are and i want you guys to look at down here is all this information, these are the weight of the bullets that we're dealing with. So at 20, 2,900 feet per second, you're looking at 147 grain, 7 mil PRC, you're at 3,000 feet per second, 180 grain, 2,800 feet per second, 225 grain. Um, and again, 300 PRC is a, a pretty interesting cartridge, especially if you're looking at getting into ELR, uh, extreme long range. Uh, or you want to go now 7 PRC, you definitely can hunt any big game in North America with it. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, obviously 300 PRC, you can as well, but man, th this is trucking. And of course, especially when we're getting into these higher velocities, 
another consideration is barrel life. I say it's a, a, a large, a, a, you know, a consideration, but you know, if you're serious about shooting at some point, you just got to be ready to smoke through barrels. And, you know, if, especially if you want to compete, you know, you're probably going to be burning through at least a barrel per year. And that's just, you know, you just need to accept that. Um, and it's probably more like two barrels a year if you get real serious into competition. Between training and actual uh, going to different competitions, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna burn through barrels. Just just accept it. All right, so six five PRC. Here's our trajectory. Um, let's just move down here to a thousand yards. So we're at two hundred sixty three inches of drop at a thousand. I'd say a little less than that. And by the way, if you wanted to, you can easily load 6.5 PRC, push into 31 to 3,200. And I'm sure you could do the same with 7 mil PRC, get it up another 100 feet per second or so, just depending on how you load them. Uh, all right, so we're looking at 263 inches of drop versus 228. This is actually pretty phenomenal. So we have the best of both worlds here. I think 7 mil PRC is definitely turning out, I think, to be, and I think 30 cal has always been the sweet spot to begin with. Um, but it's definitely turning out to be the sweet spot for performance overall, right? Um, we're getting less wind deflection, which we'll look at in a second. We're getting less drop, so we have a much flatter trajectory. Uh, Maintain velocity, all those things. Seven mil PRC is pretty darn impressive. Uh, if you don't mind going up to a long action, uh, 300 PRC, we're still trucking a 225 grain bullet, and it's only dropping right about the same amount as the 65 PRC. But there is about a 35 inch difference between seven mil, 300, and 65 PRC. Now, at some point, because of a very similar velocity and a heavier bullet, 300 PRC is going to start outpacing 7 mil PRC. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to include in our next little section of this and, and go much deeper into this than we are tonight. But it is what it is. Here we have wind drift. Um, there again, we get, it, gets, it gets pretty impressive here. At 1,000 yards, we're only looking at 44 inches of wind drift with 7 mil PRC versus 50 inches with 300 and 57 inches with 6.5 PRC. Uh, it, you know, again, a couple of years ago, this number would have been just nuts. Um, I mean, we're, it, it comes down to those longer OGI bullets, folks. I mean, we're getting much better at, at – pushing those bullets um, and, and just getting better at overall design. There's no doubt about it. This is a question that I get a lot. Um, so first of all, looking at a Horny 250 grain ELDM and the 300 PRC 225 grain ELDM, we have a bullet drop of 804 inches with 338 and only 776 inches, 300 PRC. Um, so there's no doubt that that 300 PRC is outperforming 338, which has always been the EL, you know, the ELD king. That's that's what you wanted. But what's interesting is the difference in recoil. So, what do you guys think? Go ahead and list list that down in the comments. What you guys think? The recoil, matter of fact, I'll even give you, here we are with 38 foot-pounds of recoil for 338 Lapua. What do you guys think 300 PRC is? We'll back out of here for a minute. Oh, there we go. We got the answer. I gave it to you. 22 foot-pounds. We, we pulled out of display mode. That is crazy. And again, with we throw a good break on there, and now we're down to easily 
six five PRC territory. We can easily get down to 16, 17, and probably much less foot pounds of recoil, uh, which is super manageable. So you're getting all of that velocity, all of that energy, um, and all that distance out of 22, almost half of what 338 Lapua is, uh, and, and better performance. And I think that's that's overall pretty impressive. Um, as far as that goes, folks, we are going to kind of that's, – that's as far as I can get tonight. It is what it is. But – You guys were close. Michael Hinn was the closest. You win, Mike. Top Gun again, buddy. Uh, Gary, I have an Armalite Super SAS. All right. Plan to get dials for the loophole scope for Horny Precision 100 and 178. What do you say on that round? You plan on getting dials. What do you mean? You're talking about custom dials that are uh, bullet drop compensated for that particular round? Is that what you're asking me? As far as the 178 grain ELDX, um, I mean that is a great round. I would I would highly advise against that. Number one, you can use the scope that you got, the dials that you have, and and do some shooting and figure out your dope with that. Again, you're shooting 308 to begin with. Um. Because look, man, those they'll they'll be close. There's no doubt about it. But the problem is just like with a um, BDC reticle, um, it, it's only going to work under certain conditions. You know, if you the moment that you move to a different location and you have a big fluctuation in density altitude, um, you know those are still going to be close. There's no doubt about it. But I, I I don't see that necessary at all. Alex, you know, shooting 308 all through my military career. I mean, I got to a point to where, you know, all I had to do was take a temperature reading. Uh, we didn't even worry about density altitude back then, which we would, would have made things easier. But we accounted for humidity, counted for altitude, counted for temperature. And once we did that, we knew our holdoffs. And you can do the same with that. I wouldn't spend the money on a on BDC dials. That's just that's what I would do. So um you know get some good data with that eldx or eld eldms either one of those are excellent rounds and i just don't think that uh, i don't think that that's the way to go josh i got a whole list of powders that i've been looking at um and i don't remember them off the top of my head that i found good data on for 65 prc um I have, I'm getting ready to order dyes for that, but I, I mean, I can't find, um, uh, I actually have some large, uh, primers, but I can't find powder a, and so right now I'm just kind of holding off until supplies come back around to where we can start really looking at seriously reloading, man. It, it really irks me to, I'd rather just wait until I have all my components there so that when I get everything in, I can start reloading and dive into it. Uh, but there's three or four different powders. And again, I got a literally written uh, written down on a list on my reloading table at home. Um, I remember Reloader 17 was good. Uh, there was a couple other optimal ones um, that a lot of people had a lot of good data on. But do some do some research. I do remember one that kept popping up over and over and over again that everybody seemed to think was the best. It was Hogden. Um, but I can't remember the nomenclature on that particular one right now. Let's see. Any plans building an ELR rifle or doing a video? Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, I don't think you were here earlier, Gerard. What I was talking about is, number one, uh, for those that you missed it earlier, at the beginning of the show, uh, MPA will be um, chambering 7 millimeter. PRC in the next 60 days. We are taking pre-orders. It's not even on the website right now, uh, but I will like most likely have that option up uh, either tomorrow or the, the following day. Depends on if uh, I can get Dan to, to do that for us. So just be aware of that. Um, we, it's next 60 days. So if you pre-order now, 
number one, you're first in line. Uh, I talked to them. They said we could start doing pre-orders. There's no one else asking to do pre-orders. So uh, we already have like five or six rifles that we have submitted orders for. Uh, I'm getting ready to submit a batch of orders just so that we have rifles on, on hand. Um, so if you want one, exactly what you want, if you want to get two barrels, the 7 mil PRC and the 300 PRC, that's an excellent option. Uh, you won't need an extra bolt for that. But there again, I don't plan on building necessarily one, but I do plan on ordering my rifle. And as far as, you know, putting it together, um, I actually have a scope coming for it already. Um, and we, we have a cool review of some optics that I talked a little bit about on, uh, I think, the last show. Uh, my thoughts on the Ruger's 308 SFR. Well, Jeff, you're going to make me Google something because I don't know what the 308 SFR is. Uh, I mean, Ruger overall is, you know, they've been making some good um, rifles. Uh, the Ruger Precision is not bad at all. Um, the thing is, man, most of these companies are making pretty decent rifles to begin with. Ruger SFR. <clears throat> okay, so it, it's it's a gas gun uh, in 308. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you want it for. If you're, you know, I don't know what the price point is, is on this and things like that. Um, I wouldn't expect like a precision rifle out of this. Um, you know, it is hard to get ARs, gas guns in general, to shoot very precisely for a whole lot of different reasons. And I, I would wait to see some reviews on it to see, especially at, at 1200 bucks. If you just want a gas gun in 308, I think it'd be just fine. If you're wanting something that's going to shoot, you know, one MOA, I don't think that's going to do it. Um, so you can take that for what it's worth. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any reviews. This is the first I've heard about it. So take that for what it is. You better believe it. No, you know what, man? I, I really like my 6.5. Um, I like the fact that it is a short action. Something to be said for that. Uh, it's going to be a lot cheaper to shoot. Um, I'm going to enjoy getting that 300 PRC and that 7 millimeter PRC. Uh, but I, I love all my guns. But the new one always that comes in is always the new favorite for a while. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there again, it just depends on what you're looking for, Jeff. Um, let me see what the options are on this. I'm just looking at this rifle. I got the 20 inch free float M lock. Um, let's see. It actually does look like it's that is the full length of the upper. My therapy is seized. You could use that for a video before I take ownership. Well, John, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Either way, I'd like to do a review on uh, that rifle in 300 PRC. So yours will definitely be one of the first that we get in. Uh, we've actually had already had a couple come in at 300 PRC, but it will definitely be one of the first that we've got of the mpas in a long action so uh yeah man i would love to do a uh, user rifle for a review thank you yeah you know i mean again if if you're okay i, I think you'll, you'll easily be able to hit man's man size targets up to 400 yards um and that's probably more than enough for a dmr rifle uh again if you want Something that's super precise, maybe not it, uh, but it's twelve hundred bucks. I mean, that's pretty darn cheap for a decent gas gun in three hundred eight. If you really want something precise, you know, if you're looking at um, uh, if you're looking at Larue, um, there's a couple other ones out there. 
And honestly, the most precise, which Jersey here has one on order, um, is F4 Defense. Um, I have a couple of them. I haven't. Before we had our YouTube channel is when I got those in, but I've easily shot three quarter to half MOA with box ammunition out of the F4 Defense. We are a dealer. Um, I don't know. I get on kicks, right? So I'll I get excited about new products that we get in that are really great, um, and I promote those for a long time. I forget to promote other ones, and then I kind of go through a recycle. It's just I can only do so much. And I have only so much attention span as well, as well as on top of running training, as well as, you know, answering emails all day, as well as doing orders, um, keeping my wife in line. That's really tough. Got to put the whip down, smack down every now and then, keep her squared away. She's not on this. She's not on this podcast, so I can say all that. Full length of the upper, Gary. Yeah, I'll have to look that a little closer. Uh, Jeff, you know, again, I did a review. We're not a dealer, but, you know, I think for the price, it's hard to beat. If you're, you know, if you're looking for a, a good scope under a thousand bucks, um, the Arkin, um, the EP5, uh, I mean, that was a great scope. I, I got a review on that. You can go check that out. Oh, shit. <laughs> There she is. There she is. She got me. <laughs> she got me. Primary arms, 5 to 25, 30 millimeter, and 45 offset. What are you going to put? What are you going to put as the offset, Jeff? Yeah, check that out. Like I said, I, I, this is the first time I'm even hearing about it. Uh, <laughs> she usually does. Yeah, nice. She is a saint. She is a saint. Five to twenty-five SLX. Five to twenty-five S SLX. Let's see what we got going on here. Oh, it's primary arms. Yeah, man. You know, primary arms is uh the first one to eight that I got was the primary arms platinum when they first came out. And by the way, we are a primary arms dealer. Um so if anybody's looking for anything from Primary Arms, definitely hit us up. I I just don't have – right now I don't have any of their stuff on our website. I need to. Um, and I, I think most of their optics are, are pretty darn good value. There's no doubt about it. You know, when they first came out with the 1 to 8 Platinum, the nearest thing was, uh, you know, you could get that for like 1200 bucks at the time. And everything else until um, Trigicon came out with the Credo. Um, everything else was like nineteen hundred bucks for a good one to eight first focal plane, and um, I still have that optic. I ran it hard for several years. Worked great. Still works great. I definitely like my Trigicon Credo better. Um, the glass clarity, the fit and finish, all of that, it, it ends up being about the same price. Uh, at least I think I actually had the second generation of the platinum, but I mean, compare the two, there's actually no comparison for the same price point. There's just a lot of little things that just don't compare to the Trigicon. Um, but at the time they were the best value of the market and they, it was an excellent optic. It still is. No, we are not an Arkham dealer. We are not. Yeah, man, look, you know, the fact of the matter is, or the reality is, is that a lot of these budget optics, you know, they're featuring some of the even more um, options and even some better glass than some of the premium optics were, you know, five to 10 years ago. So, like, 
you know, there's no doubt that you can do pretty much anything that you need to do with these five, six, seven hundred dollar optics. Um, so, you know, get out there and train, man. That's all you need to do. You know, it, it's it's easy and it's fun to get caught up in the gear game. Um, but, you know, it's also it also comes down to training. You can do more with a budget optic and a lot of training, you know, spend that extra money on bullets and ammo and training and you'll be outperforming anybody else with, you know, glass and optics and guns that are three or four times the price. What else we got folks? Any other questions about anything that we covered tonight? Again, I need to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do another series on this. I can probably do two or three more. I got a whole list of stuff that I wanted to cover that I didn't get a chance to put into that presentation. Um, yeah, so we got a whole lot of other things to go. Let's see. Give me on training. Uh, Christian, are you talking about the, yeah, the night force? I see it now. Night force. Yeah, man, look, I love my attacker 7 to 35 and 56. Uh, I love my 5 to 25 too, but I definitely think that 7 to 35 for 65 PRC, 300 PRC, anything that you're, you know, pushing anything beyond that Creed more. I don't, you probably, you know, do you need it? Probably not. Uh, but I will say, uh, you know, it, it, it's the glass on that thing is impeccable, you know, especially when you get out to distance, you can see the difference between some of the other optics. There's less mirage. There's just more clarity, um, you know, and, and the thing too is if you're buying night force or the other high end optics out there, you know, they don't really lose their value. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas, whereas if you buy one of the cheaper ones, you know, they definitely lose their value quicker because there's more out there. Um, but, you know, an attacker or some of the other high-end scopes, whether we're talking about Zero Compromise, uh, all these different companies, right? You know, they maintain their value because they're, they're a super, all, you know, the, the, everything in their attention to detail, you know the tracking is going to track right well. You know, they've got it locked in when it comes to glass clarity, the, uh, the many different coatings that they use, um, the electronics in them, if you get them illuminated, all that stuff is going to work in those things, especially Night Force. When it comes to, I'm still convinced when it comes to durability, Night Force is just impossible to beat. And, and the qualities there, it, it's just, you know, I, I definitely think it's worth it. I think if you can afford them and it's in your budget, man, you know, buy once, cry once, and you never... You know, I never feel the need to upgrade my 7 to 35 attacker, at least not for the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. My thoughts on the Vortex Razor Gen 3. Uh, man, my only complaint about the Vortex, we've had lots of clients order those, and I've mounted probably four or five of those on guns. My only complaint with those at all is they're freaking heavy, man. Um, the difference in weight, even, you know, the attacker's heavy, the night force are, are heavy. Uh, but man, the difference in weight in between those in the, um, uh, vortex razors is it's profound. Um, I don't know what the actual weight on that is, but it, it feels like it's double the weight. I'm sure it's not, but when you're, I literally held one in each hand and I was like, man, I can't believe how heavy this is. Uh, Vortex Razor Gen 3, wait. <sighs> yeah, those things are, those things are tough as far as weight goes. Um, 45 ounces. So that's 45 ounces versus Night Force Attacker. Let's see, we'll go 7 to 35. Wait. So it's that one's 39 ounces. And I knew they were gonna be close, but man, I'll tell you the, the weight while you're holding it, it feels feels different. <laughs> feels 
and it's only five ounces difference. So, you know, take that for what it is. I, I don't know what the cost comparison is. I know the Vortex razors have went up quite a bit from what they used to be. Um, and I'll tell you, if, it, if it's close in cost, fits within like three or $400 within cost, I would definitely go with the Night Force. And by the way, if you contact us, you want to order one, let us know. Um, and, you know, we could probably help you out in pricing with those two. Uh, good Christian. Glad you are, man. And I know you would be look, you know, that's the reality. There's almost no one that is displeased with, you know, again, any of the higher end scopes, uh, whether we're talking about vortex, whether we're talking about night force, um, you know, so now, I am curious out of anybody out there, how many people get buyer's remorse or have buyer's remorse with like a tangent theta with like the cheapest one being five grand. Um, I just don't see, I don't see that it would be twice as good as a night force. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I would have a little bit of buyer's remorse with that, but I haven't even looked through a tangent theta, so I don't know. I want to build AR-10 that can shoot long range. I don't really want to get 6.5 because everyone and their brother has one. I want something different, but it has to remain super past 1,200 yards. Um, well, I mean, there's definitely options out there for you. The, 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 the benefit, and that was one thing I was going to, talk more a little bit about but the benefit for instance 260 Remington which by the way you can get it in 260 Remington is very similar in trajectory as a 6.5 Creedmoor but the the difference is is availability and the different bullets uh available to it um and again they ultimately does have a, a better ballistic coefficient you know it's the 6.5 Creed does but you know out to out to thousand to twelve hundred yards Ballistically, they're going to be spitting distance, you know, with one another. Um, I bet around 1,200, uh, you'll have more consistency with in past out to probably 15 to 1,600, which is probably about as far as you're going to be able to shoot a 6.5. You're definitely going into transonic territory uh, around there. So that's that's the thing is that at, at 1,200 yards, both of those rounds are going to start going transonic. Um you know, so 260 Remington is definitely an option, and you can definitely find AR-10s in 260 Remington. But ammo availability, and if you plan on reloading, the, the different types of bullets that are available for 260 Remington aren't going to be there. Uh, and I think that's going to be with most similar rounds like that, man. And, you know, there's a reason 6.5 has earned its place. 6.5 Creedmoor has earned its place where it's at. Um, there was a lot of haters and including me, you know, I know when it first, probably within probably two years after it came out, I was still saying, you know what, man, this is a fad. I'm sticking with 308. I know it works. Uh, and then, you know, next thing you know, you got several 6.5 Creedmoor rifles. And and for good reason. You know, they're easy to shoot. They're easy, you know, as far as recoil, uh, availabilities there. They're just hard to beat. <clears throat> Let's see what else we got. You offer the ability to compare scopes in your training course. Yes. So we have many different optics on our guns. Uh, right now, I can tell you we have a couple of Bushnell Elite XRSs on there. Uh, we'll have an Arkin out there. Um, I'll have two of my Night Forces out there that you can take a look at, both the 5-25 to and the 7-35. to What else do we have? That's mainly... Mainly what we got. I got several of the Bushnell Elite XR, which, by the way, is a great optic, too, for the money. I mean, that's not a bad optic at all. Well, you can get something unique, man. There's no doubt about it. But the, the problem with unique is that it's unique. You know, you're not going to have – it's going to be more expensive to shoot, most likely, and your options are limited. But – that's why it's unique. Get like, I don't know, 500 Beowulf or something. Something crazy. <laughs> I 
And even if I did have remorse, I would never, I would never show it. He's super. Single arms in 300. Target system at Academy Mez, the bullet to be super to read hits. Target system at Academy. I think there was a typo in there. Or it's just, I'm tired. Army is going to 6 8 round for XM5. Uh, yeah, man. There's actually some recent indication that they may be backtracking on that. Um, we'll see. I think that, uh, I think that's a bad choice for a lot of different reasons, but um, and, and I think I think that deal may end up falling through, but we'll see. Needs the bullets. The target system can needs the bullets to be super to read hits. Uh, yeah. So, man, I look. I, I would tell you if you want a good AR-10. that meets all the criteria other than being unique. I think you'd be crazy not to go six, five on that. Um, I just can't think of any other, any other round that number one is going to work in an AR 10 platform well, and uh, still get what you want out of it. Uh, you know, that's a great question. I was looking to either get into the standard, um, MPAB action, or maybe going up to the, which is the, uh, 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 let me see here, the Axiom. I was thinking about upgrading to the Axiom on that one. Uh, they also have the, let me see, MPA. So MPA, you can also get their actions with, with the Impact, which is a two lug. I've heard a lot of good. Uh, I think the short uh, action on that is the 737. Um, but I've heard from MPA, by the way, um, from the owner of MPA. He, he, he said a lot of good things about the impact actions. They're super smooth, super nice. Um, but you can also get the entire line of the Curtis actions. Uh, there's the standard Curtis, there's the Axiom, and then there's the top of the line. Forget which one that is. Hold on, I'll tell you. I'm sure somebody's already putting it down in the comments. I'm probably wasting my time here. Competition. Oh, I like freaking I'm stupid. What action did I come with? 300 Peter C. Um, it'll be the Curtis action, which is the standard action. It, it's a great action. Like, I'm sure there are smoother actions out there. It's, I've never had a misfeed or anything else. Uh, let me look here. I'll tell you the exact options. And then I also have a text message of the ones they don't even advertise, but let's see here. Uh, real action. I need to go to... Their custom. Here they come. Yeah, so anyways, you get the the standard MPA uh, Spencer action. Um, but there again, you can upgrade anything on the, on the gun, uh, you can pretty much upgrade, you know? So whether it's the, 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 what I have at the house that I haven't done a review on, I have actually two of the matrix chassis and the matrix chassis are freaking amazing. Uh, if you go to our website, you can look at, or MPA's website, you can look at the matrix. Um, every, you can get everything upgraded on that. The, the matrix chassis is pretty freaking amazing. Uh, but you know, the only thing that I don't like about the matrix chassis is that it doesn't come with a folding stock. Uh, and I love having that folding stock. Is it better than, uh, their BA comp? 
probably a little bit. Uh, it has a much wider uh, forend. Um, it definitely has some upgraded features. It's completely customizable as far as the grip goes. Uh, you get all kinds of doodads with it where you can change exactly how you want the angle of the grip, um, where you want the thumb rest, how high you want the thumb rest. There's a lot of cool things on that. It has a, a built-in um, bag rider that is adjustable. You can adjust that up and down. Um, that's pretty cool. But there's Again, I've, I've had them for like two months, and uh, I haven't had a chance to do a review on them yet, but I will. Um, but, yeah. Define it. I'm not defining it. Trying to think of the stupid premium action they offer. Uh, most shoes would be. Uh, there's definitely less play. There's definitely a, a much tighter tolerance with those other actions. Um, and you know, there's definitely something to be said for. Anytime, so I have a defiance action. I for uh, the like premium action on one gun, and you know, I don't know that I would want to use that for competition. It is super smooth. It's super nice. I love it. It's, it's great. Um, but I have had where like you get it a little. It starts getting dirty, and you start feeling that thing slow down dramatically, very quickly. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that. That's the main thing. It's going to feel smooth. It's going to feel nice. Um, does it improve performance? Eh, I don't know. You know, I, you know, does a, does a Cadillac get you to a place any faster than, you know, just your standard old, I don't know, Toyota Corolla, Toyota Camry. And that's not even fair to, you know, uh, compare the MPA actions to that. But I mean, the, you know, the nicer actions, they're smoother, they're nicer. You're also going to pay more for them. Uh, I think the standard Curtis action does the job, feels great. I love it. It's great. You know, would it be nice to have, you know, but you're going to pay several hundred dollars more for that upgraded action. You just got to figure out if that's worth, worth to you. All right, John, I'm dying too, man. I've been up since four this morning. It is now 2.23. Well, thank you. Valor. That's it. The Valor. Yes. Yep. They make the Axiom, the Helix, and the Valor. Uh, I want to say, I don't think they make the Helix, but I could be wrong. Oh, that's where I need to go. Hold on. VA Rifle. Yeah, so hold on. I just remember where I need to go on this. Rifle components and barrels. <clears throat> Actions. Here we go. I'll tell you exactly right. And that is you get the Curtis Axiom action. They may have the Valor on here. I need to talk to MPA about their website. But uh, yes, you can get the Valor, you can get the Curtis, Axiom. I think those are the two. Um, let me see if Helix is Curtis, Helix. Yeah, you can get the Helix. The Helix is the hybrid, actually. Uh, I know exactly which one that is. So if you get that, it's on like the Hybrid Hunter. Um, not really a competition. It's mainly meant to be a very smooth but lightweight action. Uh, just the action is, you know, thirteen hundred and seventy-five bucks for the hybrid hunter, or for the action, the helix action. Uh, but you know, what I what I try to do, folks, is again, I'm very serious about. I don't doubt that those actions are great. I just haven't used them. And, and that's why you haven't heard me talk about them. I plan on getting some of those in and testing them out. But regardless of a company that we're a dealer for, um, 
I'm very careful about promoting something I haven't personally used. That's really important to me. And, you know, there's been lots of companies that we are dealers for that, you know, I, I've kind of done that where it's like, you know, I've tested these products, maybe multiple products. And, you know, they happen to sell something else. We start carrying it. And next thing I know, you know, now I'm promoting garbage or selling garbage, not necessarily garbage, but not, not something that I would be happy with and not something I'm happy selling to clients. Because, you know, there, there's lots of different products that uh, are companies that we are dealers for that I don't like certain things that they make. Um, and, you know, that's just the way it is. Mike, what's good, man? What's going on, man? Good to see you. I do. Who makes? So I just, I I actually have a Ducati now. I got a street, uh, street, a street fighter. I almost said street triple. But yes, I do still remember, and I actually missed my triumph a lot. Check out the Ruger, love to see a video and your input. Peace out. See you later, Jeff. All right, folks. I got about two hours of sleep and enjoyed hanging out with you guys tonight. We I am I am smoked, by the way. Team 55 up there is like you smoked. I am I've been smoked since I got here between jet lag and everything else. Uh yeah, I've been, I've been, I've stayed smoked. Anyways, guys, I really appreciate your time. Always love that you guys show up, and uh, we'll continue to do these. And yeah, man, it's always fun. So appreciate you showing up. Thank you for your support. You guys stay armed, stay ready, and we'll talk to you guys soon.